afternoon. Uh, I am Dylan Gautier. I'm the program director at EFA Project Space, and um, I'll tell you more about EFA in a minute. Um, just want to uh, welcome everyone to this weedy talk on a kind of cold spring afternoon um, here in New York or wherever you may be. And um, we are going to get started in just a second. Um, I will turn off this little join leave sound. Okay, great. Um, so a couple of um, kind of housekeeping things. Um, so we will have a, a Q&A at the end of some formal presentations by our two um, esteemed guests um, who will be presenting today. And um, feel free to use the chat uh, throughout the program, ask questions, make comments, give shout outs. Um, EFA is an inclusive and affirming environment. Project Space is anti-racist, anti-oppression in all forms, and no hate will be tolerated in this program. Um, especially against weeds. This afternoon's event will feature live transcription and uh, you can turn your transcription on on the Zoom by clicking um, probably on the more button and then enabling um, live transcription or um, subtitle settings for yourself there. Um, we are also gonna be recording this program. So if uh, things, uh, you know, if your internet goes out you can find it on Project, Space, um, Project Space's website. Um, I also want to do a, um, a land acknowledgement from Project Space. Um, this is Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland and gathering place for many indigenous nations and beings. When the unseated earth breathes again, there will be indigenous lives here as there are now and have always been. We'll it will still be Lenape Hoking. We learn from the bedrock and commit to uplifting, honoring, and listening to those who are seen and unseen, present and future. Uh, I want to give a general thank you to our sponsors and funders and to our fabulous advisory board, uh, as well as the um, EFA board, um, and uh, just take a moment to um, thank everyone there. And um, you can support EFA Project Space programs by going to the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts website um, to EFA Donate. And um, we uh, also sell publications on our website, catalogs from past shows that help support the work that we do at Project Space. Um, including this fabulous exhibition that I have the, uh, the, the pleasure, the honor, the privilege of being a co-curator of, along with uh, Radhika Subramaniam, who is here today. And I'll be handing over the mic to Radhika in just a minute, and Marina Zirkow, who may be joining us as well here in the program in a minute. And so um, the three of us put together this exhibition called Sprout Hinge Nap Wobble, which features Eating in Public, um, Gay Chan and Andita Sharma, and we'll be hearing from Gay today. Um, Anna Rose Hopkins and Marina Zirkow, uh, Del Harden Hoyle, Sal Randolph with Anne Randolph, and a host of collaborators. Um, just to give you a heads up, the show is on view until May 14th, and the gallery is open. Uh, we're located in Midtown Manhattan. We're lo um, located on West 39th Street between 8th and 9th Avenues, and the galleries are open uh, Wednesday through Saturday, 12 to 6 p.m. So come by, you don't need a reservation. We do ask that you wear a mask. Uh, come by and visit the exhibition. Uh, we also have a number of upcoming events and programs. Um, the next event that's happening next week, uh, next Wednesday on Zoom, is uh, a talk with Heather Davis um, on toxic progeny in the ends of the ocean. Uh, she'll be in conversation with Marina Zirkow and Anna Rose Hopkins. And then we have three in-person events that will be taking place um, in the space, as well as an ongoing uh, plant swap that is part of Gay and Nandita's project. Um, that they will um, hopefully also be talking a little bit more about this afternoon. Um, so come and join us at these uh, in-person performances uh, before the show closes. And the closing event on May 14th um, uh, features a, a, a performance by Tanika, uh, Tanika Williams from 1 to 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon. And then uh, the closing will happen kind of all the rest of uh, the afternoon. So I um, want to thank you all for joining us today and thank Ellie Irons and Gay Chan for being here and Radhika Subramaniam, uh, who I will now pass the mic off to. So thank you um, again. Thanks, Dylan. Um, thanks to all for coming and, and of course to Gay and, and Ellie for being with us today. Um, the, the curious title that is our exhibition, um, one of the things that that the title meant to us is that we would always be in a hinge or in a conversation with others that ex that extend beyond the show, beyond the show itself. So I'm really happy today to have not only two sprouters, but two sprouters who are hinging with us as part of the conversation. Both Ellie and Gay, um, you know, bring a, a kind of practice that has several overlaps, but also certain significant differences. And I'd be very interested in hearing them talk through that in regard to weeds. They're both in many ways profoundly interested in 
um, what we might call social engagement or social practice in work that's deeply steeped in um, ecological issues and also in certain forms of um, exploring certain forms of relationality. And, it, you know, in thinking about this show, which was done, which was conceived very much under the shadow of the of the climate change crisis, climate crisis, um, but overtaken in a peculiar way by another crisis that made us want to rethink what it meant to live in a condition of urgency. Weeds have been a very interesting site uh, for thinking about that because weeds offer very different time frames and very different ways of existing in the world and throw into question most profoundly what it means to be in place, out of place, um, something that I think is at the forefront of our most of our imaginations in trying to think of whether this planet is still our place. So um, I think both Ellie and uh, Gay are going to offer in different ways um, a very, you draw from the very deep experience of not only learning from weeds, but also um, thinking about what it means to work with and alongside weeds. So I will turn it over. I believe Ellie will speak a little bit first and then uh, Gay, and then we'll have a little bit of a conversation together and then throw it open to the floor. And um, Dylan has very helpfully given you a link um, to their bios. They, they both have a very accomplished CVs. So um, it's something that you might want to refer to later rather than my taking the time now to, uh, to read out what will be a fairly extensive account. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ellie. Thanks so much, Radhika. I'm going to do the classic screen share here and get going. Um, I will ask you, as you would expect, if you all can see my screen and not my notes. Does it look good? Yep. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, I'm so happy to be here in conversation with Gay. Um, Gay, as you probably know, I hope you know, I've admired your and Indita's work for quite some time. And um, being invited to contribute to this confluence, this hinging mechanism of ideas and practices brought together for this exhibition is also really a pleasure. Um, so thank you, Dylan, uh, Marina, and Radhika for these uh, curatorial efforts. I'm talking to you today from Mahican land in current day Troy, New York, which is about 150 miles upriver from New York City. So I'm even more deeply enmeshed in this winter turning into spring. Um, I'm calling this short talk today, Practicing Plant Human Solidarity, Learning with and from Weeds Through Eco-Social Art. My main focus today will be on the Laundry Disturbance Laboratory, an ongoing unlawning experiment involving public sculpture and lots and lots of digging up turf. But to get us going, I want to provide a little bit of context about my work more broadly. Along with a lot of others, I practice what I've come to think of as eco-social art, a form of interdisciplinary work that combines ecological and socially engaged art through a multi-species lens meaning it engages with more than human life and land as active partners. I specialize in forms of eco-social art that cultivate plant-human solidarity. I think teaching and learning with and from plants is one way to build and renew essential forms of cross-species allyship. And um, apropos our theme today, I'm particularly committed to learning with and from disturbance-oriented plants who are experts at taking the first step to steps towards healing land that's been disturbed and damaged by industrialization, urbanization, and extraction. Like this pokeweed plant sprouting from toxin-filled soil that's been capped with cement and gravel as a remediation method. My practice is dedicated to conspiring with them in the sense described by artist and anthropologist Natasha Myers to lessen the harms of our compromised times to use a phrase um, drawn from the feminist philosopher Alexis Shotwell. Reclaiming the term weedy from its derogatory associations, this orientation grows out of hands-on collaborative work in habitats that are often overlooked as sites of natural cultural value. 
like this car repair yard turned urban weeds garden, which was the headquarters of my artist collective, the Environmental Performance Agency in 2017. These disturbed habitats also include urban sidewalks and streets with their fragmented plant communities and locked away soil and the intensively managed greenery of monocultural lawns like the National Mall in DC. Each of these habitats springs from land damaged by the extractive pressures of capitalism and settler colonialism driven by Western and global elite ways of being. These are ecocidal systems I am born of and complicit in. Following Potawatomi writer and plant biologist Robin Wall Kimmerer, weedy plants, whether they are native here or they're naturalized or introduced, rebuild and repair damaged land, preparing the way for recovery. That little sprout really wants to be a tree, maybe a honey locust. My turn towards these weedy guides started about 10 years ago when I started making watercolor paints out of weedy plants living around my studio in current day Bushwick, Brooklyn. And these experiments grew into my ongoing feral and invasive pigments project. As I foraged and painted and taught others to do the same, the weedy plants and their habitats began to teach me guiding me to engage with fraught questions around belonging, nativeness, and xenophobia, and the agency of plants and the living land. In this painting, we see the complex migratory histories of Asiatic dayflower and pokeweed, painted with plant parts foraged in diverse urban habitats. Getting intimate with the weedy life of these cement and asphalt coated urban spaces led me to notice another limiting coating, turf, which is especially common as a default land strategy in the shrinking city I live in. Working with my next Epoch Seed Library collaborator, Anne Prococo, in 2018, I launched the Lawn Redisturbance Laboratory, or Lawn Lab. Here in Troy, city regulations forbid noxious weeds over six inches tall. Anything that fails to meet the somewhat arbitrary standard of cultivated should be chopped. That includes long growing lawns. Our university grounds are highly maintained and chemically treated. So in response, we approached a range of lawn wielding institutions and individuals and invited them into what we've come to think of as a public experiment in collaboration with seeds, thyme, and weeds. By removing turf with small hand tools in workshop settings, we engage in a visceral unearthing of other potentials occluded by the lawn. Sending the turf to the compost bin leaves this minimalist square of vulnerable looking bare earth. We top these squares with sculptures, they're hard-edged international yellow, international safety yellow pyramids, and they offset the standard one by one meter transect, which is common to ecological studies in the dominant Western sciences. Sometimes we add notes of care and encouragement, and then we leave it to the sun, wind, rain, and soil to activate the healing abilities of these disturbance-oriented seeds that we know are already sleeping in the earth. Across the season, we return to the redisturbance to engage in multisensorial fieldwork, alone in small or large groups, sometimes offered as an audio tour or facilitated as a workshop or via printed handbooks and maps. We witness and record the plant-led process of recovery and renewal. So nothing about the way these plots heal themselves from our redisturbance is perfect or pure. While some might hope for some kind of luscious wildflower meadow that's perfectly attuned to a set of native pollinators, these cosmopolitan weedy assemblages actually reflect back at us the reality of the land we're working on. Land weighed down by construction rubble and herbicides, mower compaction and habitat fragmentation. In these sites, I see plants and land caring for each other and for us as well as possible to draw on feminist science studies scholar Maria Puig de la Bella Casa's rethinking of care across human and more than human communities. I've learned so much from these habitats and their plants and people about how to orient myself in the world right now. A world that is ever more deeply engaged in exiting the crumbling Holocene and fumbling groping, sliding, careening into whatever it is that comes next.
from the vantage point of this particular land, which is where I've worked the most intensively. It's the former floodplain of the Mahikanitak River, aka the Hudson, constrained by the first lock on the Erie Canal, later the site of a two-family home with residue of a foundation and a parking lot still there, turned gap-filling lawn in the wake of redlining and disinvestment, now turned eco-social art project, and informed by a range of other toxic lawnscapes, whether fertilized into exuberance or laced with heavy metals, or just mowed decade upon decade, 80 years, in the case of this one at Greenwood Cemetery, I've gotten deep into the complex terrain of caring for and resisting lawns, meadows, grasslands, turf. Behind each public sculpture that has arisen over five seasons is the give and take of negotiating it into being against the grain of normative landscape management through work with the humans who control and participate in shaping lawn habitats to look the way they do. Buy-in from landscape managers, property owners, and those who labor daily to maintain lawns is essential. So this means cold calls, emails, meetings, site visits, and workshops, um, all of which are not simply administrative hurdles or bureaucratic annoyances, but rather a core aspect of the work to which I bring an eco-social lens advocating for plant agency as central to the work of landscape maintenance and care, while also learning a lot from those who are deeply embedded in the techno-managerial work of controlling vegetal life. Whether in a lawn or a so-called vacant lot, the approach to maintenance and stewardship in these spaces remains troubled. When might we collectively see it as abhorrent to send a plant to the landfill? as we struggle to build healthy soils and reduce methane emissions? What kind of cross-species solidarity will help us really internalize the links between climate justice and our hyper-local green space habitats? And while Lawn Lab offers the smallest of interventions, I see it as a link in a growing web of related projects in the arts and beyond that push back against monocultures of all kinds and build plant human solidarity for a multiverse, I hope, of potential human vegetal relations. And I'm really glad and grateful um, to count Gay <laughs> and Nandita among those who are strengthening this web. So thank you for that. And I look forward to hearing um, from you, Gay. I will stop my share. OK. Thank you, Ellie. So I have a lot of thank yous too. Um, it's really great to be a part of this exhibit. And I want to just thank, you know, Marina, Radhika, and Dylan for just, I, so because of COVID and inability to travel, I've never really done a show without doing hardly anything. And so that process alone has been very interesting and exciting um, and learning how to let go and just going with the flow. I think that parallels a lot of what's happened with my work in eating in public as well. I also wanna thank Caroline and Luke, the two interns who helped me navigate this, the store, which is behind Dylan right now in his background. Um, it's been a privilege to be a part of this. So I have admired Ellie's work for a long time and she's been really dealing with weeds for a long time. So I've, uh, I've, I'm so thrilled when Dylan suggested a conversation between the two of us. So um, I look forward to that portion of it. So this part is just to kind of give you an overview since most of you probably don't know about um, what I do. Eating in public is half of my practice and maybe more and more more of my practice um, I have a solo art practice as more gallery or museum you know um, oriented but eating about in, in public started in 2003 kind of accidentally um, as a project between Indira and I we started just by planting some papaya seedlings on quote-unquote public land because we had too many and it spiraled into this enormous project that has kind of taken over my life. What eating public tries to do is to complicate our understanding of space and territory, both public and private. We implement 
um, all sorts of systems, autonomous systems, where people can um, give away or get stuff without any intervention by capitalism or the state. So these are just a few examples of um, what we've done. Uh, so we, we do a lot of free stores, free fridges, seed exchanges, um, dinners that, that people can share food, uh, that they have. Um, there, there's one rule for these digger dinners. It's kind of like a typical potluck, but whatever you bring, you have to either have grown, fish, hunted, foraged, been gifted, found or stolen. And at the beginning of these dinners, people explain where their food come from. And it's really just kind of like um, uh, to, to understand where our sustenance and survival is driven by. So uh, most of our work take place in non-art sites, in common places like curbs and university campuses, community centers, or just you know hacked bus stops and random spaces. Sometimes we do participate in more traditional art, art spaces. Um, and, and when we choose to do that, we turn the exhibit into either distribution centers or um, as a way to provide instructional media. Uh, these are just a few examples where people can get say recipes, um, how-to booklets or get material to, to further create things. So that's just kind of a broad context of what eating in public does, but we want to focus on um, weeds today. And the first project that we started doing on weeds was in 2011. And I focused on three common weeds that's found all over the world, dandelion, purslane, and amaranth. I collected all of these seeds for a long time. And it's kind of ridiculous because these weeds are just literally everywhere, all over the place in every place. So to use this completely worthless and often hated material as a source of it show was funny to me. And I, um, in the, the first exhibit of this project called Free Grinds, which is in pigeon, is meaning free food, was in San Francisco and I just didn't feel like it was proper for me to ship such worthless junk. So I decided to build an artwork that doubles as a shipping crate. So it basically folds out into a weed seed distribution station and recipe um, stamping center. So in this, in this sculpture, you can see what the weeds look like, where they might grow. Um, you can pick up some seeds that the envelopes are all upcycled. The gallery, which is Southern Exposure at the time in San Francisco, they collected their one, um, their used paper that was blank and white. So I would cut it in quarter sheets and people can make their own recipes by making stamps. So this is one of my earliest, I think, using kind of instructional media as, as a creative practice. And like, I'm so into that. And I think being an educator um, is a great way of thinking through like, what is, the, what is art practice anyway? So this became also um, recipes online that you can download, working with um, artists who, with me became scientific botanical illustrators. We started making um, videos of how cooking videos. So like myself, it took me two years before I dared to try eating amaranth. And so what I'm trying to do with all of this instructional media is to make it as easy as possible for someone like me who's hesitant. So um, we started doing cooking and tasting demonstrations. They're often pop up unannounced. We show up at farmer's markets, sometimes at art openings and start cooking. This is a more recent one. So we've gotten more fancy. Uh, it started off with tasting of five weeds that are raw. 
Then we made tea with blue Puerto Rican leaves. And three different recipes of cooking amaranth. So a um, ohitashi style, the Japanese uh, vegetable side dish and a banchan style, which is the kind of small plates that often begins a Korean meal. And then we did a more of a Chinese style stir fry on site. I'm currently in the um, Hawaii Triennial and with their stipend, I was able to also create a book of common Hawaii weeds. I don't know if you can see it's right here. And so the way that I'm distributing it is also at the free stores that we've started with um, share seed stations. In the share seed boxes. And while we do the cooking demo, people can also pick up seeds from, um, from the actual plants. So another aspect of these cooking and, and tasting events is that we've been trying to harness every opportunity to pack more content in there. So the plates have become a source of inspiration for me. These plates are called, what's called dinner plate aralia. Um, actually a, um, a leaf that's often used to serve food on in Palau. We've also used banana trunk. So if you chop up a banana into stalks and you peel them open, they're like little troughs. These are banana flowers, petals, and then bamboo sheaths that grow out on the side before each um, the the stock branches out. So obviously these are all biodegradable and just thrown into the compost afterwards. The most recent of my weedy work um, are, um, it's titled Movable Feast, and they're edible weed educational planters that are popping up um, throughout Oahu. We have seven sites. And so there's one, this one is in front of our house. So every time I go out, there's often someone hovering around and I do an impromptu fresh weed tasting event. The tags are made of upcycled milk bottles and metal sticks that come, that come from broken umbrellas. The drum, the planter drum obviously are, I think they used to hold soap or something. So my interest is, you know, this is very close to my house, a vacant lot that Ellie talks about. It's so much that getting interested in weed has not only rewired our diet, but completely rewired my brain in the sense that a space like this is a food garden. And so I think the, the all of our instructional media is to share that perception that what's right around us is completely invisible to you unless you take the first step towards the weedy investigation. So I'm gonna stop here, hand it back over for our conversation. Thanks Gay and Ellie, that is really great. Um, I think I see several things that intersect your work and also things that I'd be curious to hear because they, I, I think you, you probably come at them a little bit differently. But maybe I would just start by asking not only like what led you to weeds, but also if you could say something about how working with weeds, it's kind of where you ended, Gay, but how working with weeds has shifted either your practice or your way of being in the world. Like what is it that might have, that the weeds themselves might have infiltrated back into the way in which you work? 
Ellie, would you like to start? Sure, sure. Uh, thanks, Radhika, for that question. And thank you, Gay. I've always, it's always a pleasure to learn more about your, your adventures with weeds. Um, yeah, for me, I, I come from a background in painting and drawing and environmental science. And I think um, weeds really helped me get out of a kind of problematic Western frame of environmentalism. Um, when you're being trained in anything related to conservation, you tend to be taught that nature is over there away from you and that it needs to be protected <laughs> and that it doesn't include humans. And I think, you know, I struggled with that throughout my 20s before I started painting with weeds because I was living in New York City and I thought I had to go elsewhere for inspiration and starting to work with the weedy plants around my studio really completely opened my brain up to be able to read um, and take in kind of um, approaches to multi-species um, world making that I don't think my brain was ready for without the weeds teaching me that um, that there is um, really vibrant life everywhere and that I'm part of it and that there's, um, I'm meant to be part of it and that I need to rebuild a reciprocal relationship, especially as a settler in a increasingly intensifying um, climate chaos world. Um, that there's just so much for me to learn right there. Um, so I really do think that, um, you know, that that changed my making entirely. It also opened me up to socially engaged art. I didn't necessarily think of myself as a socially engaged artist and starting to make with and alongside and learn from weeds um, led to opportunities to teach other people how to do that and then to come to understand that as a core part of the practice rather than um, education as separate somehow. So um, yeah, just completely <laughs> changed my trajectory, I think, as an artist and a person in the world. In, there's um, many years ago, I received the highest compliment um, I ever have about one of my, my exhibits. Um, this guy told me that my work was like a barrel of monkeys. And I don't know if you, and you all know this game. If it's like a 1960s game, is a tacky plastic barrel that the game is that you shake it and you open up the barrel and in the barrel are flat monkeys with arms that go like this. And then the point is that when you pull out a monkey, whoever have, can pull out more monkeys with interlocking arms would be the winner. And what he meant by that is that when, I, when he encountered that project, he saw the first monkey, oh, and oops, there's another monkey and there's another monkey. And so I, um, ever since he told me this, I use like a three monkey minimum for my own work. If it's less than three monkeys and the work is just no good, start again. So I think that the, the whole Weedy project, it's got a lot of monkeys, you know? And I think it really is about, um, when I was talking about earlier that it rewired my brain, it made me think about who I am as a person, as a gardener, and we always make judgments, you know? And I used to pull weeds out because it was in my way of what I was trying to plant. Um, there's this, so there's this super weed, there's an article in the Atlantic about the super weed, which is amaranth, a perfectly edible plant, but that's taking over the corn fields. So instead of trying to just cultivate the amaranth for food, they're trying to eradicate the, the amaranth or whatever insecticide that they develop, the, the plant in like one tenth of the time is way ahead of science in acclimating so that it, it, the, the, the herbicide doesn't even affect it. So I think it's, it's um, by rewiring my brain, I mean that, that it, it changed the way that I garden and cultivate for food and what I eat. And also in Hawaii, and I think many places around the world, there's this idea of invasive species. And I understand that, um, you know, when a, in a, when a new plant comes into an ecosystem, often it grows too well and it becomes, uh, takes over everything. So it becomes a monoculture. But this, this term of ecological balance has jumped ship, so to speak, that anything that's not native has been deemed invasive. So I think that there's so much um, xenophobia 
and nationalism in that approach. So here in Hawaii, I want to show a few, a few images that these are exercises for school kids. There's only certain life forms that, the, that should belong. It proposes that certain life forms can exist in a certain space. And so these kinds of um, rhetoric scares me a lot, particularly in these times where we have massive migration, like the refugee crisis all over the world, um, inspired by war, um, you know, corrupt government or, you know, say in Ukraine. And I think that there's, it's interesting to me that, that the, the rhetoric of anything that's non-native is invasive happening at the same time, there's this massive um, my crisis of movement. So I think that's an important part of uh, why I started to do work on weeds as well, because I wanted people to look beyond just what is you know, native, but the value of plants and what is should be eradicated. Because I feel that that's um, kind of genocidal. And being an immigrant, I think it, I, it's a very um, it's a subject that's very close to home. I can follow up a little bit on on that. So on the one hand, I hear a little bit from Ellie that the weeds offer, in a sense, even the even someone inexperienced or someone who doesn't know enough or feels tentative or whose practice was not in that to enter it because weeds in a sense are, you know, uncared for and they're uncaring in a, in a, in a way. And so they allow anyone to engage. On the other hand, as you're saying, Gay, they're freighted with huge issues that, you know, that tie to nativism and, um, xenophobia and um, anti-immigration policies and obviously ecological um, considerations and so on. So there must be in the course of you, both of you doing your work, a whole set of engagements with people that you have to, that who, who believe in these things, either the nativism, xenophobia, ecological imbalance, or who are just like, this is, this is not att attractive, it's not in place, the lawn is beautiful, kind of. So there must be a series of engagements that you have to do in order to be able to do your projects. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the kinds of things that remain to some degree invisible in the, in the presentations of the work, but which are obviously integral as um, it, to producing them, to producing these projects. Sure. Funny yeah. it, um, that as artists, I think that a, the bulk of our practice is to bring attention to things that are invisible or not valued. Like, you know, my training as a photographer, you know, you photograph piles of trash or broken curbside and things like that. So um, we just put bookends around something so that we could pay attention to it. And, and I really love Ellie's pyramids because and I love the, um, I think her courage to do less rather than more. You know, it's, it's almost a resistance to, in contemporary art, there's like the, the enthrallment with the spectacular. So I love the whole less thing. And it takes a, a courageous artist to do less, actually. Um, and, and because it requires you to slow down and really pay attention. So I think a lot of both of our work, it's, it's about that, um, you can call it mindfulness or just, just paying attention to what's actually there rather than what we think should be there. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's fair for sure. Um, and, and thank you for that. <laughs> I think that's one, gonna be one of my top compliments that these are courageous <laughs> sculptures. I appreciate that. Um, I think that, um, you know, in terms of getting folks on board, 
Um, I think sometimes because it seems small, it's, oh, I just have to give away a meter of my lawn. Oh, okay. Well, I can let this weird artist do that in my yard. And I do it and they don't expect what's going to happen over time. They just can't quite imagine that their neat, tidy lawn is going to disgorge what to them becomes chaos. Um, and I have had, I mean, I've had people very enthusiastic and happy to be part of the project, but I've also had people withdraw because they think the sculpture is sending the wrong message to their neighbors, even though it's encased in this, you know, structure of care and there's, clearly life happening there. I do a lot of work to bring people along to have that kind of mindfulness experience where we, you know, use the structure as a kind of corollary to our bodies and scoot up and touch our knees to the sculpture and bend in and experience the life that's in it. Um, but the, the learning goes both ways. You know, I'm trying to teach and guide folks to another kind of, um, out of this ecological tidiness disorder, I've heard it called, um, but also learning a lot about the double bind that um, folks who steward land in an unsustainable way are in. So at um, Rensselaer Polytechnic, where I've worked a lot and where they have some really rigorous, <laughs> violent line, lawn care going on, um, the head of operations there is a lovely human and she knows exactly what they're doing and she doesn't necessarily want to be doing it. She arranged for me and 20 lawn care employees to meet up and have a workshop. And we talked about, you know, phasing out of glyphosate and what they're going to do and how they won't be able to take care of the campus when that happens. And they, you know, the expectations of the president are completely unrealistic unless they spray poison. And um, it really, you know, when we go back to talking about um the way that species are perceived like her nemesis is yellow nut sedge that comes up in the lawn really rapidly and aggressively and it's green it looks like a grass when it's mowed but it's like a slightly different color so the president doesn't like it um and so much of that is systemic and way outside of the control of these individual gardeners or even the president of the campus because we're the pressures on our ecosystems that create the opportunities for nut sedge to spring up in these degraded lands that have been lawns for, you know, decades um, are related to so many other aspects of why we live in this profoundly unequal society and have these um, parts of our cities that are completely devoid of what someone might consider high quality green space. And then these other parts of our cities where so much care and attention is lavished and like literal poisons are poured onto the habitat at the expense of a 20 person landscaping team. And like, what do we get for that? So when I go to the question of what is invasive, I always think about the invasiveness of these really violent land care regimes and like how to back off of that and, and who's, how, how complex, I guess, the, the steps back are. I've learned a ton. I've become a lot more humble <laughs> through doing this project, I think, about um, what it means to change regimes in lawn care. Yeah. I want to just stop for a minute and, and see if there's anyone in the audience who might have a question. I don't know. I don't uh, think anyone has posted in the chat, but yes, uh, Kirby, oh, please I, go I, ahead. I did hi. hi, Gay. <laughs> uh, hi, hi, Tessa, actually, and, and, and hi, Marina. Actually, um, I really love this, but I was thinking, this is actually a question for Marina. Um, I was thinking like about jellyfish. Are they a kind of weed? <laughs> I mean, can we think of that as like a weed that's like, it's, it's invasive, yet we can eat okay. them. Well, oh, yeah, uh, they, I think, occupy a really different kind of place in our social ecosystem, I think. I, um, and they are technically not all invasive, right? So they, some are introduced, some are, you know, snuck in, some uh, are native. They're extremely mysterious. Their morphology is still a mystery to jellyfish scientists mm -hmm. um, when they're polyps they could live for 10 years and then they spoon off like dishware out of like the magic bottle for like nobody really it's jellyfish scientists don't understand 
that much about the morphology. Uh, and a scientist will be absolutely adamant that these are not all any one thing. They are not the result of human degradation, you know, or compromised ecologies. They 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 are not going to say that their climate uh, increased because of climate change. So so and I. I, maybe more to the kind of poetic point, um, they actually occupy two areas of our mind. One is enchantment and the other is hatred and fear. So weeds, unfortunately, well, except for like dandelions, right? Which are definitely that kind of signal, social signal species of like, when you're a kid, you love them. And when you're an adult and you wanna have a lawn, you despise them, right? So these are, I think, very interesting kind of social vectors. Right, right. That's a, Which that's are like blemishes on potatoes too, I guess. You know, we don't like eat them, and, and so we, you know, genetically modify them so they're pure. Nice, and great talk, you guys. I agree. It was a really awesome talk, both of you. The other thing about weeds is that they are um, they're they're deemed to be weeds and undesirable because they are not easy to commodify. There's something about certain things that their shelf life is too short or something that they, they have escaped being exploited by capitalism. So then that, that means that they, they should just not exist because what use are they, you know? And I've really, you know, the, the, the weed planters have, because the idea, even in my mind, like, oh, well, they will grow easily because they're weeds. <laughs> like, oh, no. <laughs> No, I've experienced that too. They grow where they want to grow. I mean, yeah. I've planted no, gardens before and they're like, mm -mm. <laughs> I mean, sometimes yes, sometimes no. <laughs> I think that they have, you know, pulled out whatever they need from the soil and they don't want to grow there. So like right now in front of the house, the weeds that is supposed to be in the planter are around the planter and the inside that looks like shit, you know? So it's like, okay, this is what you want to do. All right, well, just go with that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah, and that is the seeding of control with I think both of these projects is being okay with I mean I've had them mowed the sculptures mowed inside because someone thought the sculpture was the yellow thing so they just mowed inside you know <laughs> it's just like you've got to and that becomes yeah. a part of the I mean it's a failure in a way but it's also so telling about what our assumptions are about what matters is like that can't possibly be the sculpture she must just really like this yellow shape so <laughs> Yeah, so I, a question I, in the chat. Sorry, Gay, please go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. This no, 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 no. Finish, finish your thought and then I'll. Well, what Ella's talking about, like the, the conversation that goes on with the um, lawn management people and what Radico is talking about in terms of the, um, the curatorial practice and the bureaucracy and Marina with the scientists. And I think that you know, the, um, in our way, I always talk about you know, what is the intended audience. And I think when you do this kind of work, is that, that every part, of the of interaction becomes part of the work um, because um, like um, what am I trying to do like the 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 book ends becomes bigger and bigger because last week the the telephone cable guys came to redo all the cables on the street and we had this impromptu weed tasting event and so it's like so this is an invisible part that, that people don't think about in, in terms of the work that I really, really love. So there's a question in the chat about needs and weeds. That is, you know, what, what is the sort of needs boundary, the needs that a weed might have and the needs of a balanced against the needs of a cultivar that is somewhat essential like rice or wheat. Do you have a take on that? I guess corn, your corn and amaranth example is one of them, although maybe corn is not quite in the same place, but. Yeah. I mean, I could offer some thoughts. In a way, I think about them both as in deep, long relationships with humans and our regimes of disturbance, right? So um, the kind of, at least depending on the kind of rice you're talking about, I mean, there's very different practices of rice harvesting and cultivation around the world and, and certainly right here in the United States in terms of um, you know, indigenous practices for harvesting wild rice and that relationship, which is a deep reciprocal relationship also, but um, like the need to turn over and renew the soil. I, when I was still 
an environmental science student, I, I worked briefly with rice farmers in, in Costa Rica. And it was such an intense process to get a rice farm, like a field prepared for, um, for cultivation. And, you know, the race against the weeds was one part of it, the race against these um, ducks that love to eat it and they put cannons out to scare the flocks of ducks away. Um, but the, the weedy species, a lot of them, not all, but a lot of them are disturbance oriented. So because we churn up the soil and they, they go into business immediately and they're not a long-term species. We, by continually churning up the soil in our urban habitats with our landscape maintenance that often looks like, let me just take this um, tractor across here and bulldoze it, we invite those plants right back rather than allowing gradually for some of the woodier perennial species to grow up and shade out um, the weedy species. Um, so I think, or these disturbance oriented species. So there's actually a lot in common <laughs> between uh, like a heavily um, mechanized industrialized rice farming process, at least from the what little I know, and the way that weeds spring back when you create bare earth, like I create in my sculptures, or it gets created on construction sites all the time. <laughs> so I'm not sure this is a really answer to Abigail's um, question, but you might be interested in James Scott's book called Against the Grain. Um, he's an anthropologist, I believe. Um, so the, the um, thesis of the book is that plants like wheat fields and rice fields because they they're visible and also that they all mature at the same time um, was a kind of plant that was ripe for the development of the state because then they could come they know when your, your wheat will be ready to harvest and they come then they come in and tax and tax you so when certain people didn't want to be part of the state they would run into the hills literally and plant other things that would be invisible. Mm. So I think that's, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of <laughs> not directly answering the question at all, but I think it's, it's fascinating what is um, food source and, and resistance to, you know, nation states being controlled by nation states. And weediness is, is part of the unruly, the uncontrollable, Can and I, I ask us somewhat, sorry, Ellie. Go oh, no, I just say that I love that weeds can hold both of those facets of a very different answer mm -hmm. <laughs> to that question. That and yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so I wanted to ask a somewhat difficult question, Gay, which is where do you see weeds? So if you have ideas of xenophobia, nativism on the other hand, indigeneity on the other, how do you see weeds? Do weeds offer us a different way to think about some of the some of the tensions and possibilities? Yeah, I I'm um as an artist, I'm very I'm trying to eschew um, my practice from using like symbols and metaphors or even allegories, but to to actually deal with the literal of what is there. Mm -hmm. So I think the danger of you know across the political spectrum. Monarch means migration, <laughs> you know. Taro means Hawaiian natives, right? I think both are dangerous because um, monarchs are actually living beings, and so are taro and you know sea turtles. And I think that once things become a symbol, then we can't see them very well anymore. So my interest is really to, for our collective survival, let's look at what's here. And let's look at, but you know, whether in my little planters or the street, how we can maintain the space, not just for human consumption, but keep the pollinators here. Uh, what plants would, because we have like an influx of a of a new bug that's that's uh, harming the avocado trees. So uh, they're called the um, avocado lace lace bug, I think. And there's only one natural predator here, which is the green lace wing. So what do I plant to attract the green lace wing so that they can control the avocado lace bug, you know? So I think, so for me, that's a very um, grounded 
embodied way of approaching with art, you know, all types of life practices rather than, than um, you know, the, the tractor have to mow it all down so that we can regrow the wheat or we need to, like this street should look like this. And so we're gonna take everything out and transport what should be here. So I think that like Ellie's work, what's, what's beautiful is that let's just see what's already there. I think we're just at time. I wonder if anyone has a, a Matt, did you have a question? I wasn't sure if your hand was up and and if you were. Sorry, no, my hand wasn't up. That came up when a truck with a radio, like a two-way radio passed by. But I just put that in about Mas Masumoto's invitation of weeds in to an, ex an est long established commercial farm in California. And his, his books and his essays speak to many of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. If there are no other questions, I'm going to thank both of you very much, Ye Chan, um, Ellie Irons, for being with us this afternoon. It's always great in the middle of the day to be, to be charged up again without coffee. So I, I really appreciate both of you being here. I know it's very early in the morning for you, Gay, but for, for us, it's at the flagging end. Uh, <laughs> and this has been a real... Um, this has been a real boost to to listen to you and to be um, and to be thinking through, thinking with, and thinking alongside weeds. Thank you very much to all of you, um, Thank you all. for attending. I think the recording will be on EFA's website. Is that right, Dylan, or EFA's channel? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, both. We will put.